So they asked me um, I, I, to talk about targeted antimicrobial prophylaxis in transrectal prostate biopsy. And the second talk uh, after Dr. Kim will be about our ever-growing problem of multidrug resistance. So no conflicts. So I, what I'm going to do in the next um, 20 minutes is describe the current scope of our antibiotic resistance, what we're seeing in the transrectal biopsy. A lot of the information comes from Europe, but also some studies that have been done here in the United States. Uh, kind of the risk factors, kind of a questionnaire, what you can ask your patients, what things we're facing globally. And um, a new part is using um, rectal swabs to identify this key multidrug resistance, just like we do with VRE. So uh, as you know, um, you know, transrectal biopsy allows, uh, can allow direct transfer bacteria from the rectum to the prostate and include this as a potential reservoir, especially that the prostate is so walled off to our immune system, which makes it a nice nidus of, uh, nidus, nidus of infection for our bacteria to live there because the immune system really can penetrate and some of the antibiotics we use don't have very good um, uh, concentration in the prostate tissue. So, you know, it is used often, um, use antibiotic prophylaxis. There's about a million um, prostates done, uh, biopsies done per year, um, according to the VA records. And out of those, about 5 to 10 percent can get infections, depending on the area. So, one of the studies done is trying to understand the scope of the problem. Um, this is a study done um, through the VA hospitals. This was done in Cleveland through Case Western. Um, was looking at fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli after transrectal biopsy of the prostate in the Veterans Affairs healthcare system. And why E. coli was chosen is when you look at the, the most prevalent type of uh, microbe, it tends to be E. coli or Klebsiella. So what they did, it was a retrospective study. They actually span about 13 years of data. This is the beauty of the electronic medical records in, in the VA. And so they looked at this at the VA hospital as well as outpatient clinics. And um, they also looked at a more specific area between 2011 and 2013, looking at nested case control studies that undergo um, trans, um, transrectal biopsies to look at risk factors for infections and how much of a fluoroquinolone resistance we had. So surprising, the first is you see at this, uh, this slide, is the rise. So if you look uh, carefully over here, in 2000, you had a lot of, on the gray bar, a lot of the fluoroquinolones were susceptible. So Cipro was used often. This is what is on the guidelines. Um, you use Cipro before, it would do fine. But as the years went by, you see now the gray area is being decreased and the orange is taken over, which are representative of the fluoroquinol resistant E. coli. And this mainly is either ciprofloxacin or, or levofloxacin. So what you've seen is in the last 13 years is we have selected out bacteria that are not susceptible to um, our antibiotics. The other graph um, actually shows the um, complicated by bacteremia. So this one was just complicated by UTI, and this one is the bacteremia. And so again, you see that in 2000, we had a rise on numbers, and then as they went in after 2005, we have a rise of fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli. There is a plateau over here, and um, one of the um, key points of the studies that says that the, maybe the reason for the plateau was that um, they were using less um, leva, uh, ciprofloxacin for these procedures. But, or it could be that the bacteria were getting resistance to something else. Um, but as you can see, using a quinolone today is probably not going to be the best option. Then when you look at, at your graphic areas, because they looked at the whole VA system, they were able to separate this into the eastern, southern, western, central area. You could see that most of the first time between 2000 and 2003, we had kind of clustered all together. But after 2003, we had a rise, especially on the central um, US, and as well as southern. And then there was a dip more on the eastern part than opposed. But the trend is going up. Maybe the eastern seaboard is going down. Maybe that has to do with more antibiotic stewardship or less usage. But in general, the uptrend of um, resistant E. coli is, is uh, alarming.
So there is a five-fold increase in the incidence of the post-procedure E. coli bacteriuria and bacteremia between the 2000 and 2013. So that's from the U.S. When we look at Europe, which is usually when I, when I teach my fellows and residents, I say look at Europe because whatever is happening in Europe is what we're going to be happening in the U.S. We're going to have in what I call, uh, well, you know, Spain, Portugal, Italy, um, the, the former Eastern, um, uh, Eastern Europe will see a rise of resistance or more of 50%. Um, while places where they have very strict antibiotic stewardship, like in the Scandinavian, you'll have less of a resistance, less than 10%. So when we look at the epidemiology, we looked at the E. coli will have a resistance alone about 21% about to aminopenicillin, so ampicillin and amoxicillin, 57%. So the use of ampicillin or amoxicillin for treatment is actually not good. And this is where we sh you should look at your antibiograms of each of your institution to look at the percentage. For example, in, in our institution, if we look at a county, we have about um, 35 to 40% resistance of quinolones to our E. coli, but if you go to uh, Baylor St. Luke's, which is only like a 10 minute walk, you'll see that the quinolone resistance is only 20 to 25 percent. Um, but the other thing that is alarming is that the rise of monotel drug resistance. So meaning that your cephalosporins, your quinolones are not going to be working and these are your ESBL and particular acinetobacter and Klebsiella pneumonia are coming up. So both studies identified risk factors. So when you look at the urological history, definitely is going to be the repeated urinary tract infections, recurrent ones, uh, asymptomatic bacteria that has been treated and maybe did not need to be treated, uh, previous biopsies. Uh, and then the comorbidities. We're seeing more of our diabetes, especially when you want to see if the diabetes has an A1C above 7%. It is a risk factor. It has to do with neurogenic the neurogenic component, but also as the A1C goes, our leukocytes actually are more slower. Uh, they get sleepy and they don't act as well. And then, of course, the immunosuppressor that we have with HIV chemotherapy and transplant. But the one that is rising and we're seeing more is in the recent international travel. So. This was done recently. Um, they, it's an update on travel medicine that was published this year where uh, Rupe and all looked at the digestive tract colonization of multidrug resistant enterobacteria, so E. coli and Klebsiella. So in meaning that as we travel and we start looking and there's more than two billion travelers per year or people that we see because they're coming for urological procedures or other, other things, we'll see that there is a rise. So you'll see that, for example, in India and the Middle Eastern, we have an increased multidrug, and that means um, extended beta-lactamase, but also what we call carbapenemonase. And what we see in, in this study, what they followed these patients over a year, and they saw that the highest inclination of being a carrier, being colonized with this multidrug resistance, were mostly on the first month. And so usually you're, if you have to do a, a procedure, you're looking at maybe, you know, start looking after three months or six months because you're going to be less colonized with these types of bacteria that we might not have. So, for example, when we see a patient from... Um, south, south, uh, from Arabia, from Saudi Arabia, they usually have carbapenemase resistant bacteria. And so as an ID physician, it's a little harder to think of how I'm going to be treating. So when you look at this, this was put out as a questionnaire of risk assessment. So we have the risk factors, we have host related. So this rectal flora that we're going to have resistance, repeated infection, hospital admissions, and then surgery related, uh, using, depending if you're going to do transrectal, transperitoneal. We were talking last night with Dr. Katman that the transperitoneal, which is done most, in, in, and they did a study in, in Europe, obviously didn't have as much infection, but it was a more uh, cumbersome procedure because you had to do general anesthesia. Um, but then the questionnaire that you should have for your patient is, well, so have you had recent antibiotic usage? Have you traveled abroad? And how long were you there? Where were you? Are you recent hospital admission? Are you a healthcare worker? Because we're all colonized with MRSA by this time. 
Um, bacteria, have you had an indwelling catheter? Have you had any urine culture before? Or any comorbidity that is gonna affect your immune system? So thinking about that, that will start helping you think about how it is approaching. And so as we do this uh, prostate biopsies, it is changing the antimicrobial prophylaxis of solution. And probably that is not. We have approaches right now because we want to make sure the patient doesn't get septic or doesn't get bacteremic. But changing the antibiotic is not the solution. But maybe looking at the risk factors, trying to modify those risk factors, or finding another technique might be actually most of benefits. So looking at the rectal swab, so this is from a recent study where they did a cohort study looking at rectal swab for culture. So the, the patient comes in, comes to see you, you rectal swab and you send it to the lab and you ask them to test, you know, for multidrug resistance uh, bacteria. So um, it's, it's tiny the, the here, but they looked at, th it's uh, 314 um, patients that were enrolled, and about 173 of them had empiric antibiotics. They have different ethnicities, uh, their PSA, their cherison comorbidity, and the number of biopsy cores. What you do notice in the antimicrobial prophylaxis is the number of patients with non-ESBL was, you know, had already, um, resistance to Bactrim or already had resistance to even gentamicin. So the other thing is to look at this, what we call targeted prophylaxis. So you already have your rectal swab. You know what it is. So let's say you have an ESBL E. coli. So how should we change our prophylaxis. So in the European urology guidelines, they actually are using an aminoglucoside in conjunction with a quinolone. But we already know that the quinolone is not gonna be working, so that is gonna change to a usage of a carbapenem plus an aminoglucoside. So you are now you're gonna have two double gram negative coverage in order to be able to cover all your basis of resistance that you have. So in this study, where they look at this, they looked at fluoroquinone sensitive isolate organisms opposed to, you know, so they had 57 of their uh, E. coli were seven, uh, sensitive to fluoroquinolones, which is very low, meaning that 43 were resistant, and their Klebsiella's was a little bit more sensitive. So they came and did an antibiotic sensitivity to the organism, and so most of them were susceptible to uh, piperacillitazobactin or ceftacidine, but very, very minimal to um, aminopenicillins or even um, cotrimazole. So what they did is that they, um, the rectal floor, there were about 40% that were already colonized with uh, resistance. So using Cipro or level fluoxacin as a prophylaxis before the biopsy is not gonna work because you already have that. Uh, using the pre-rectal swab culture, you can direct the, the antibiotics. So if you know that it is, in, in one of those rare cases that is susceptible to ceftriaxone, then we would use ceftriaxone as your prophylaxis before, opposed to using something like um, levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin. Um, so they looked at this evaluation and at a different study last year um, on targeted antimicrobial prophylaxis for that in a prospective cohort trial. So same thing what I said, it was, okay, so we, we already have our patients, we are gonna come and try to put them in the protocol. So they started with 563 patients, ended up with 484 patients, and they put them in two sides. So they did the rectal swab, was it ciprosusceptible, so fluoroquinolone susceptible, or ciprofloxacin resistant. So they had about 84 of them were susceptible, about 80 of them, or 16%, were resistant. Out of those resistance, they got, an, they got the susceptibilities, and they were able to see that if they use uh, cefuroxamide, 47 of them responded, uh, but the combinations of quinolones that, you know, that were recommended, none of them will respond. So in, in your guidelines, you have ciprofloxacin and gentamicin as one of those parts, but those were, because of the cipro being resistant, it's not gonna work, and then erdapenem or just gentamicin alone. So when you look at this, they looked at who got complicated. Um, they had, if they intend to treat any infection, what type of complications, and then depending on the protocol. Um, 
So the resistance were about 15%. Um, they had not, 96 did not have any infections, but about 2.5 had an uh, uncomplicated UTI and about 1% had a uh, UTI with sepsis. So when you looked at the complicated, the patients that actually got there, uh, looking at their score, there were several, and they, they tried to run, see why it didn't work. So for example, the uncomplicated one, it said Cipro was susceptible on the rectal swab. They used Cipro as prophylaxis. They had a urine culture. The organism was septal, but it is considered a Cipro failure. And why is it considered a Cipro failure? Because they got the ciprofloxacin, and the patient still got sick. So that makes us think that there is some clonal part of the E. coli that might have um, resistant to ciprofloxacin. So the treatment was ceftriaxone, and in this time was seen and discharged. And other ones, we had uncomplicated, um, you know, UTI. Uh, we had resistance to, uh, um, to Cipro. Uh, quinolone was used like amikacin. It was susceptible to amikacin, was not hospitalized. It resolved by, on its own, and, but they categorize it as an amikacin failure. And sometimes it depends on the host and depends on, on, the, on the patient. When you had the urosepsis ones right over here, you could see that most of them, um, they had either cipro susceptible or they were Bactrim uh, resistance. The treatment was chosen on a penicillin, and um, some of them had hospitalizations of two to five days. Some of them had better. So the last one, where it had a, a um, it was someone of 48. Their Charleston scores was low. Um, their failure was is was in, uh, failure of screening of increased organism. So um, when they looked at it, the E. coli had to be an ESBL, had resistant to Cipro. Uh, even though the initial one was susceptible on, on an anterior uh, urine um, culture. Um, what we're seeing is that nitroforantrin is another one that is used, which is, doesn't, doesn't, is not very good for prostates, and so that might have been. So the patient had been started on Vanco and Meropenem, patient did well, got discharged on trimetropin sulfa. So, trying to screen early and trying to gather all the information probably has you have a better outcome. So again, targeted antimicrobial prophylaxis is achieved at a low rate of infections complications in patients with cipro susceptible or cipro resistance. Um, this, su this suggests that we can individualize method of prophylaxis may be widely applied. So it is type of using kind of precision medicine for individual patients instead of having more of a cookie recipe that it can, we can apply to all of our patients. So th the recommended prophylactic regimens that we can use, um, the ciprofloxacin is probably going to fall out of use, especially with the high rates. So if you look at the antibiogram around your, around your area or your hospital, and you have a high, so I'm saying more than 20% of them are resistant, cipro is not going to be working for you. Then um, you could use Bactrim, or you could do, um, we prefer using amicacin than gentamicin because of the um, resistance patterns. Um, gentamicin gets resistant very quickly, so we use amicacin instead as a one-time dose. It stays in the GU system for about 96 hours. And then we're using more carbapenems or ceftriaxone depending on your, um, on, on your um, resistant bacteria. Now, if the patient does get septic, so the first thing is to call your friendly ID so we can actually run some tests. Um, so what we start using for ESBLs besides the carbapenems is that we also have very targeted cephalosporins used with, beta, uh, with lactam um, inhibitors in order to help like Avicas and Sorbexa. Um, but we also look at what type of, uh, if they're producing certain types of uh, resistance patterns and knowing what it is. For our carbapenem resistance that we do have sometimes selected out, that's when we're going to use the Avicas, which is ceftacidime avibactin, or Cervexa, which is ceftocelin tasobactin. Um, the Avicas right here, it is more preferred for organisms like Klebsiella's and E. coli's, while the 
uh, ceftazone, tazobactans, we preferred it for pseudomonas. Both of them have FDA indication for complicated UTIs, and that's how those two have been approved. But after that, we have very little um, new antibiotics to use, and we don't want to use like colistin or polymyxin B, uh, B because of the problems with nephrotoxicity. So the key points are that um, in order to avoid some of these complications, the best part to do this is to look at the antimicrobial resistance strain, look at the antibiogram so you can start looking at what key uh, roles are you going to have. Stratify, use, look at where the patient is, how well controlled they have the comorbidities, where they have travel, do the rectal swabs to approach a more targeted based uh, prophylaxis, and that also will help with your um, stewardship at your institution. Thank you. And the road is very long, and this is a sunset here in Santa Fe. <laughs>